Alex. What's going on ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Alex, AKA Alex Vagabond. And in this video, I am taking you on a bit of a journey. We are in the area north of Auckland and uh, we're staying in this epic little Airbnb, kind of like farm stay vibe. We're gonna be meeting up with some friends who run a really interesting business. Uh, they're beekeepers, they make manuka honey and I'll be explaining a bit more about that later on in the video. And then, in a couple of days, we will be reunited with our dog, Lanka, uh, and explaining everything behind how we got him here and his whole journey. So, it's gonna be a fun video. Um, I'm excited to take you along on the journey, and let's get into it. What if I told you that one out of every three bites of food that you have is thanks to a bee? Would you believe me? Well, it's true. Bees are responsible for pollinating over 80% of the world's plants. In fact, 70 out of 100 of the top human crops are pollinated by bees, accounting for over 90% of the world's nutrition. But the sad news is, is that bee populations around the world are declining faster than ever. Scientists believe that those declines are caused by habitat loss, pesticide use, and climate change. But the one place where honeybees are not in a steep decline is here in New Zealand. So in order to find out why and learn more about bees and the honey making process, I traveled north from Auckland with my wife Carrie to a beautiful little town called Mangafai. We rented a little Airbnb and got settled in for the next couple of days. Okay, well this place is awesome. Definitely just complete lifestyle goals, really. You know, it seems like they've probably just taken a couple of trailers, maybe a uh, shipping container or two, and then they've just arranged them kind of in like a horseshoe shape with the central area being this little outdoor living space, but everything just opens right up and um, just absolutely gorgeous design. Take a look. But enough about our accommodation. This video is about honey and it's about bees. And in order to learn more about both of those things, we met up with Richard Kidd, an apiarist and the owner of Marshwood Apiaries. Apiarist means beekeeper. Our most important asset is our landowners, because, oh. <laughs> yeah. Our most important asset is our landowners, so we need to, um, make sure that what we are allowed on and off other people's land because yeah. because we treat it with respect and uh, reimburse them for the privilege of being there. In a strange twist of fate and coincidence, Richard is the husband of one of Carrie's childhood friends who met him, fell in love, got married, and moved to New Zealand herself. So when the Kid family invited us to come learn more about beekeeping and honey making, we jumped at the opportunity. They do sense nervousness, yeah. so just be as confident as you can and you should be fine. Cool. Um, what can I show you here? But see these girls with their bums up, mm -hmm. flapping their wings? Yeah. We call that fanning and what that is, is the, the bees creating an air current within the hive. So when nectar comes in from a hive at roughly 70% moisture, mm -hmm. here's a boy. This one here's a boy and the boys don't have a stinger on the back and their only purpose in life is to procreate. The girls will tolerate their presence during the summer mm -hmm. because they might be needed to mate with the queen mm -hmm. when the queen, new queen is born and she goes on a mating flight. But come winter, they're just a bird into the colony and they can't even feed themselves. So the girls will all kick the boys out and uh, let them die a cold, lonely death outside the hive. Sounds oddly familiar. <laughs> There's more though. Oh, There's really? more. If they are lucky enough to, to win the Queen's favour, 
they, they go on a mating flight and the queen will copulate with as many of the boys as she can um, and if the boys win the race and copulate with the queen um, she'll snap off their phallics and they'll fall to the ground dead but wow. with but a smile on their face. Their reason for being is fulfilled, right? Yeah, because I mean, Only for genetic diversity. Everything else is um, kind of rough though the that queens. they break the phallic, the phallus off. That's kind of Oh, intense. they've got to maximize the genetic material that they, they receive. Because wow. once the, the queen will only go on a mating flight once in her life, and during that on that one flight, she's got to have enough semen from all the boys, and she might mate with you know a dozen or more boys, to lay hundreds of thousands of eggs. Wow. So, um, these girls, they're creating a current within the hive to allow for evaporation of moisture from the nectar. So the nectar comes in, and the bees go to the flower, they drink the nectar and it, put it into their stomachs, they come back and they they put it into the frames within the hive and then they evaporate the moisture off and that evaporation process as well as the combination of enzymes in their gut um, turns that nectar into what we know as honey and once honey has reached its maturity and it is below about 17% of moisture um, they put a wax capping over it, seal it in there and it will last forever until um, until we eat it, something else eats it, or um, that wax capping is exposed. The honey goes alcoholic, fermented into meat. So I have read online about um, archaeological digs in Egypt where they found inside of tombs honey and it was dated to be around 3,000 years old, and it was still in the same form as it would be with, you know, coming out of the hive. So when you say that it, when you say that it lasts forever, do you literally mean that it, you know, could last? Well, like you say, if, if it's not exposed to moisture, because moisture will, will start it to ferment and turn it into alcohol, um, then yeah, it can last thousands of years. Wow. Um, so keep it dry keep it safe and uh, you've got a product that will last forever. Amazing. With a bit of an introduction to beekeeping, it was time to suit up and take a look inside the hive. So we drove across the coastal mountains to one of his more scenic hive locations. something that I've always been interested in, so I feel pretty lucky to be out here today. I'm not the... <laughs> I know, right? Why are these necessary? Obviously these sting. Smoke interrupts the bees' communication signals, so if one bee decides that you're an intruder and is trying to tell all the other bees, hey, sting this guy, well the smoke will settle them down. Won't allow them to communicate and will make them feel hungry and go and eat some food. When we got pregnant with my firstborn child, we were living in the city and were suddenly struck with a bit of a conundrum. Do we stay in the city and live the city life or do we try something new? And uh, my parents had recently moved up to the area where we are here now mm -hmm. and provided an introduction to who became my, dear, my business partner, Alan. Showed up on his doorstep and 11 years on, I'm still here. Convinced him that I was going to be a good business partner and I was a hard worker. I worked for free for a a length of time until we gave me the opportunity to buy in. 11 years ago now, I bought out Alan last year. Alan's happily retired and grown from 400 hives, but now we're just ticking over the 1200 beehive operation. As well as our bees growing, we've also grown a factory side of our business, the process of taking honey out of 
the honey boxes and putting it in usable state for people to put it into retail packs. So beekeepers in the area bring their harvested honey to us and we have the privilege of extracting that honey from the honey boxes, putting it into a drum, helping them with the, the growth of their own businesses by aiding them with that, that side of their business. It was obvious that Richard loved bees and was passionate about the honey business. So as we opened up the first hive, I asked him about the life cycle of a bee and what role they play in the local ecosystem. The journey that our bees take over the, the 12 month season that is their life from winter to winter is, is quite incredible. So bees don't only do honey, I mean they're, they're involved in the pollination not only of, um, of your fruit and veg but also um, the bees from New Zealand end up in North America helping with the pollination of the North American crops as well. So when I talk about the journey of the bees it, it starts for us, it starts in, in early spring, late winter. They don't hibernate, but they certainly slow down over winter. So when they start to wake up from that, that slow growth stage in their season, and we get them ready to go into pollination of crops. The beehives migrate during their life. So they'll go to the avocados, then they'll go to the kiwi fruit, and then from there, our hives will, will go to a honey crop. After the honey crop, we've just started um, helping out with other beekeepers in the area to, to do bulk bee supplies to North America. So we literally go to those hives, making sure we leave the queen and enough of the population up behind within the beehive to, to survive the winter. We then shake off all the excess bees, put them into a transportable queue with a couple of days worth of food, and we put them on a plane and they go to North America, help with the pollination of North American crops. And that is more important now than ever before. With bee populations in North America declining faster than ever, New Zealand's surplus bees are sorely needed to help rebuild populations and pollinate crops in other parts of the world. And New Zealand's unique position becomes even more apparent when we begin to speak about Manuka honey, one of the most expensive and rare honeys in the world. Manuka honey comes from manuka trees, a hardy scrub-like tree native to Australia and New Zealand that's renowned for its pharmaceutical benefits from teas and ointments, but most notably from the honey made from its flowers. But manuka honey is rare, only being made a few weeks a year when the manuka seed pod flowers and the bees feed on the pollen of the manuka tree. The honey made from this brief period of time is then measured to decide whether or not it can actually be called manuka using the UMF or unique Manuka factor. The higher the factor, the higher the percentage of Manuka and the higher the health benefits of the honey. Yum. Well, what's so special about Manuka honey? Well, the big thing about Manuka is it's proven antibacterial properties. So all honeys have some goodness if you put them on a, on a wound as a topical dressing, but Manuka has been proven through numerous tests and studies that it is significantly better than other honeys out there. Like Richard said, Manuka honey has been scientifically proven to be antibacterial, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, and have antioxidant benefits. And when applied to the skin, the honey can aid in wound healing, especially burn Burns, treating acne, and antibiotic resistant strains of infections like MRSA. This is the mother plant, Manuka. We will praise it for its um, medicinal properties and the honey that it can produce. And then this is its sister, Kanuka, and they look very similar. And the easy way in this state, when they're not flowering, to tell whether one's Kanuka and one's Manuka is to look at their seed pods and manuka has got big balls and kanuka well we can't even see any there so easy way to tell the difference nice mm. so with all the incredible benefits that bees provide us from honey to pollination to increased agricultural harvests it's our responsibility to look out for the bees and to think globally while acting locally to help ensure their survival. That was one of the coolest experiences I think I've like ever had in like the animal world. Um, you know, being an avid gardener, uh, but like an urban one, it's really interesting coming out here into some of the more rural areas here in New Zealand and learning a lot more about how people make a living and how humans and the animal world can kind of work together in this symbiotic relationship and I think beekeeping is really a powerful example of that and bees have never been in a more difficult position than they are right now globally 
Um, but they're also, you know, the more that we begin to understand bees, the more we realize their role in um, all of our agricultural systems. So our ability to grow food to feed a growing world is intricately connected with the health of bees. So coming here and learning a little bit more, definitely uh, very eye-opening and I'm super grateful to Richard and to Autumn for allowing me to come out here and uh, experience this and to take all of you with. So we'll definitely be back, we'll definitely be learning more, but this was really cool. We can do a couple of simple things to help protect the bees, like planting flowers or vegetable gardens in our backyard, as well as work in our local communities to preserve wild areas and wild habitat where the bees can forage for food. We can also ask our local councils and representatives to ban toxic pesticides that kill bees. Because isn't it worth protecting the pollinators that provide us with food? In the end, their survival is intricately linked to our own. So to find out more information, you can check out the Xerxes Society, which I have linked in this video and you can find out what you can do in your local community to help protect the bees. And lastly, I want to say a huge thank you to the Kid family. Thank you Richard, Autumn, and all the girls for showing us an incredible day, educating us about bees, and for uh, hooking us up with some delicious honey. Thank you all so much. Okay everyone, well I know this video is a little bit different than my previous videos, but if you enjoyed it, please remember to give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down in the comment section and tell me your thoughts about this video. And if you are not subscribed to my channel yet, please help me out and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future videos. Okay everyone, have a good one, peace.